Sorry about that. Looks like we had a little um, hiccup on the technology side. Let's see if this is going to help. Okay, so <clears throat> after you take your credits at uh, school, your first school, you transfer to your second school. And not all those credits count, uh, but they give you, they don't count towards your degree, but they give you, they do transfer the credits. So let's say that you got all 66 credits. Now, you, in order to graduate, uh, for most baccalaureate degrees, you need 120. And if you've got 66, but let's say um, only 40 of those counted towards your degree, you're going to have to take uh, uh, more than 120 credits total in order to graduate. And in some instances, um, not in some instances, but in many instances now, what we're finding is we're finding that, there, that students are graduating with an excess number of credits. And this is a study that was done just recently in Texas. And if we look at their graduates, we see that, remember, 120 what is, need, is what is needed to graduate, but on the average, they, their graduates had 147 hours accumulated prior to them getting their baccalaureate degree. So in Texas, again, the average number of years that it took was 5.3, and the students accumulated more than 27 credits that were required. And of those graduates this past, uh, in 2011, 58% of them, more than half of them, had more than 135 credits, and 35% of them had more than 150 credits. So you can see that you're spending more time, more money, using up your uh, financial aid, all in order to reach the requirements for graduation. So you might think that that's, in itself, is um, not a good thing, but look at what a new trend that's taking place now is, and that is that states are beginning to look at penalizing students with excess credits. This past year, the Nevada Board of Regents uh, passed an excess credit fee. And what this fee is, is that they're going to charge 50% more per credit hour for students that have more than 150% of, of the credits that they need for graduation. So in Nevada, the per credit fee now is $191.50. And if you fall into that category where you're going to have excess credits, you're going to have to pay $296.75 for every credit hour that you take. So it's just another way of, it's, I shouldn't say it's just another way, it is another way that students are being penalized um, for not taking the right courses are not getting credit for them. And this just isn't true in uh, Nevada. Other states that have already passed excessive credit fee schedules are the ones that are listed here. Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, Texas, Virginia, and Utah. So <coughs> we've got an issue here. Transfer of, or the mobility of credit from one institution to another is, however, is starting to become recognized. So a number of states have passed legislation requiring schools to adopt and use the same information for comparable courses at two-year and four-year institutions. Um, that's course title, identification number, description. This is what's known as, um, as common numbering. Now the students that are transferring from participating schools in the common number courses all receive credit for those. So you, there won't be any evaluation process that takes place. Uh, but the problem with this is that most of them, the schools are saying, okay, we will do common numbering, we will accept the courses, but we'll only do that for the lower level courses. So if you decide to transfer after you're starting to take more upper level courses, you could run into the same issues that we've been talking about already. And how many states have about 30 states um, have some form of common course numbering now, which is a good thing. You know, again, the bad thing is that um, this is the same slide, so I'm just going to move through this one quickly here. The bad thing is, is that um, they're only for the lower level courses. <coughs> okay, if you're at a community college, and a lot of this transfer work is at the community college level, they have two plus two articulation agreements. And the articulation agreements 
are set up so that a student who graduates, you have to graduate, a student who graduates from a community college can take all 60 credits, it generally takes 60 credits to graduate from a community college. They, they will then earn their associate's degree and the um, receiving school will guarantee that that uh, student will receive junior status. So it, it's, it's a little misnomer though because you may receive junior status but again, depending on what the degre degree requirements are, uh, you may still need to take a few extra classes in order to satisfy those requirements. Today, you can see that more states than have uh, these type of agreements than the common uh, course numbering. 46 of the 50 have some form of example. But let's take a look at, when I say some form of the example, probably the most um, aggressive in this area is in Florida where they have both independent colleges and universities all recognizing the two plus two type of agreements. For, uh, but however, like in Delaware, they have institutional agreements between specific schools, not all schools, only specific schools. And participation of this is not mandatory. The schools have to elect to do it themselves, whereas in Florida, it's legislated and has to take place. And then in Nebraska, um, they don't legislate it, they don't even have that many, they just encourage schools to, to participate. So even though there are schools that, even though we said that there were 46 of the 50 states that had some of them, you can see there's very, very varying um, imp ways that they implement it. And in Minnesota and North Dakota, this is something that's very rare because here you've got actually cooperation between the states where the states will say, if you take, if you graduate from a community college in either of the states, all of that will be transferable to the four-year institution, again, in either state. Again, that's very, very rare. The rarity of this is that most of the um, <coughs> legislation and the oversight of, s of systems are at the state level. And so one state will say, we do it this way in this state, another state will say we do it that uh, different way in our state. Okay, as we move on here, hopefully, click the next button. Uh, another way that um, people are trying now to create better ways for the transfer of credit so students avoid the transfer shock is what are known as degree pathways. And typically, these are again with two-year schools. So you have a two-year school and a local four-year four school that enter into some form of agreement. And those agreements um, not only say that we will accept the credits in mass, like a two-to-two -two, uh, program does, but it actually maps out specific courses down to the major level. And though you probably won't be able to read it here, we, uh, Academy One actually has a software package that we create that shows what the student should be taking in each of the semesters to be assured that they are on a graduation uh, degree path, uh, path to completion of their degree, and also that all of those courses will count for credit at the receiving institution. Now, one of the states, not many states have these pathways, but one of those states that has been at the forefront of this is Tennessee. And uh, one of the reasons why Tennessee is there is because there are uh, now a lot of movement towards trying to get people through degree completion. Tennessee has what they call the Drive to 55, which the governor has instituted, that says of those people who are adults, uh, who would be college age or older, uh, they want to have at least 55% of the Tennessee population in that particular segment of the market to have some form of degree, be it an associate's degree or a baccalaureate, baccalaureate degree or something higher. The drive to 55. And we're starting to see this now. It's interesting that Tennessee picked 55% uh, percent because nationally, uh, Arnie Duncan uh, and President Obama, Arnie Duncan is the Secretary of Education, uh, they have all been striving or asking states to try to reach 60%. The reason why they want to be at 60% <coughs> is that, uh, and you know, this is um, common knowledge now that you know, uh, it was just 10 years ago that the United States had the highest pop highest percentage of p 
people in the world uh, with a uh, post-secondary degree, and we now are not even in the top ten. And in order to get to be number one again, we have to get up to 60 percent. Now, the, the, in addition to the sort of uh, formulatic, form, formulatic, and, and state legislated ways that courses can be uh, equated, uh, another way is by having them done on individual course by course basis. And where you'll find this happening a lot is in the private school uh, situation, where you don't, where there are not schools that are participating on a state in a statewide system. They're private schools. They don't have a whole lot of um, um, need in order to attract or work with uh, governing bodies. Uh, though that we see that there's more and more cooperation taking place here. But basically, what we're doing is that you know all colleges will accept transfer credit. Um, but they just may not accept everything that you've taken, as we've seen. And they, they're basically doing this, uh, the faculty and the staff at the colleges and universities are making these transfer evaluation decisions every semester. So every semester, new courses come up, they're making these evaluations. If they don't have good systems to do it, as we talked about um, earlier, there may be errors, they may not be automated, it may take a long time, you may not get your evaluation until after the semester starts and you end up taking courses you don't need to. So there's a, uh, some very uh, tangentially related issues uh, that will come up because of this. Um, but those institutions that are transfer friendly are now starting to publish and put onto their websites courses that you're taking at one school, you can put it in to their website in the transfer um, section on their site and you can say okay will this course transfer to your school in this particular example you can see from Lansing Community College which is a two-year school in Michigan the class was biology and in the first case it was 201 they want to transfer it to Michigan State University well the person puts in biology 201 in this particular case, they actually just put in bio. Sometimes you can do that. You can just put in the whole department. And there were two courses that uh, were at Lansing Community College, Bio 201 and Bio 203, that they have done some form of evaluation on. There may be other courses at Lansing that Michigan State just hasn't done anything with yet. But for these pr two particular courses, um, you can see that they're, one is under evaluation and might be worth some type of a credit, and the other doesn't transfer at all. So, <coughs> other forms of academic credit. Well, if you remember that little uh, comic uh, that I showed you at the beginning, and we talked about it being a collage. My transcript was a collage. And it was a collage because there may be some things like four years of um, skiing in Tahoe and a stint shearing sheep. Now, those four years, during those four years skiing in, the ta in Tahoe or shearing sheep, you may, you may have learned some academically related um, information that could be equivalent to some type of course at a university. In this particular case, it may be far-fetched, but in other cases, it may not. And what uh, schools are now doing is they have something called prior learning assessment, where you can say, I would like to get a prior learning assessment done for this activity that I have done before, that I have partaken in at some point in my life. And this provides academic credit for the learning that was gained outside of the classroom. Sometimes you'll see this as being done, um, you know, for if you've done internships, or if you've been in the military, or and say in the reserves, you've got, got a lot of training. Even um, um, McDonald's now, uh, through some of their uh, training programs, you can get some academic credit by going through a prior learning assessment. It's been around for a long time. You know, one of the things that during World War II, um, when the GIs were coming back, they want, a lot of them had a lot of training that, that was uh, given to them, and they wanted to get the GIs through college more quickly, and so they started giving the credits uh, to help push that degree completion. And as we saw, the government now was trying to get 60% of our uh, population with a degree, and so PLA is starting to gain a lot more acceptance. Other things that you can do is you can take advanced placement uh, tests. There are a number of different testing 
right? And we'll talk about those here. Advanced placement, we've got 34 different exams. <laughs> those are specific exams for, let's say, biology, history, uh, Western civilization, uh, French, whatever they might be. Um, but, you know, you, you take one of those tests and you're given a score. And generally, uh, those scores are zero to five. And what we will find is you'll find that the test scores, what is acceptable for credit varies. Some scores will accept a three. More rigorous schools may only accept it if it's a five. Then there's the college level examination program, or known as CLEP, which is very similar to PLA, but instead of submitting sort of a portfolio of work that you've done with the PLA process, the prior learning assessment process, here you actually sit down and take an exam. And there's 33 different subject areas for CLEP. Those are subject areas, not exams. And in each subject area, there are multiple tests that you can take. And the credit gained here, so if you take one of these CLEP exams and they say that, okay, this is equivalent to our accounting one class and the accounting one class is equal to three credits, they will grant you three credits for passing that course. Not all schools accept the CLEP though. Um, so you, again, you're going to have to be very um, diligent on your part in looking at that. And then, Lastly, if, there, if you haven't, you know, in high school, primarily it's when kids were taking their AP classes. You know, college level exam program, the CLEP test are done generally by older adults that have a lot of experience. Uh, but you could also take a challenge exam. And the way that a challenge exam works is that each individual school will put together a course of their own. So if you are at a school, you tr transfer to another school, that school denies you credit for, that co for a course that you felt you should have uh, gotten credit for, one of the things that you can do is you can say you would like to take a challenge exam. And the challenge exam uh, would then be given to you. And if you pass the exam with a certain score, and the scores vary by colleges, you will then get credit. It uh, sounds like a pretty good deal, but you have to realize uh, that you're going to be paying some small fee, generally between 20 and 30 percent of the cost of the uh, course in order to take the exam, pass or fail. So again, you're going to be paying more money for something that you've already taken. Then there's the DSST test, 38 different subject areas with multiple exams in each area, and these are um, very similar to the uh, CLEP and that started off with uh, those people who were in the military. So, <coughs> in summary, what can we do to sort of avoid transfer shock? Well, the biggest thing is, is that, you know, you have to be aware that it's going to be there. And you've got to be aware of the fact that, you know, the timing of the transfer evaluation itself could be problematical, as we saw. Um, you've got to be aware that the earned credits that you've already taken aren't going to be recognized by, may not be recognized by another school. So you need to come into this uh, situation with your eyes sort of wide open. And if you are getting credit, those earned credits may not be applicable to your uh, particular major, particularly if you've decided to switch majors when you switch schools. And then you need to certainly be aware of the fact that you don't want to accumulate too many excess credits because there could be policies in place that would penalize you for that. You want to take advantage of um, a couple of different things in order to help avoid it. Um, there are certainly the transfer and articulation agreements that we've talked about already. If you haven't explored those, um, when you are looking at to transfer from one school to another, you certainly should. Uh, they clearly show you, they cl show you very clearly maps on what will transfer from the school that you're at now to the school where you're intending to transfer. You can look for degree pathways. Not all schools have them. Um, as we saw, they were somewhat rare, but if there are specific degree pathways, so de those degree pathways will show you the, the individual courses um, that you need to take. And then you should look at the school's individual uh, transfer articulation websites. Almost all schools have them now. Um, transfer students are a big part of the population, as we saw. Uh, this, this coming year, there are going to be about 22 million uh, students who are going to be in college and if you take those 22 million students and you say at some point in time 60% of them are going to be having uh, more than one 
uh, court more than once go on their transcript, you know, that's 13 million students. Uh, so colleges are definitely interested in the transfer student population now and are becoming uh, much more friendly in terms of posting on their sites uh, the type of credits that they will accept. So be sure that you do these things. Be sure that you are your strongest self-advocate. If you get denied for credit, you know, don't just accept it. You know, um, ask why. If that reason isn't a strong enough reason for you, you know, say what can you do in order to prove your case. And I used to work in the admissions office, as I said, at Temple University. About half of our incoming class were transfer students. Uh, we worked with them one-on-one -on -one in many instances, and in some instances, uh, we just weren't that familiar with what um, the courses were and what the syllabi, beside what the syllabi said. So make sure that you are a s strong self-advocate. Excuse me. <coughs> and then utilize any transfer resources that your current school or your target school offers, because all schools now will have some personnel dedicated to transfer students. Unfortunately, they're still understaffed and often overwhelmed, uh, but please try to take advantage of them. And don't forget about prior learning assessment, uh, testing out options, and then some of those things like CLEP and DST. The ones that I have listed here for um, the Interna in International Baccalaureate and the AICE are uh, primarily at the high school level again, and and done both here in the States and European. So we're pretty much at the end of what I wanted to talk about. Again, I'm from uh, Academy One. My name's Mike McIntyre. You'll see my email address is up here. And if you have any questions on anything that we've talked about here, I would certainly be glad to help you. Personally, I would uh, answer any questions that you might have. And we are at a point in the presentation where we can take questions. So if you have any questions, you can type them in in the chat area. And as they appear, I will answer them for you. So far, I don't see any questions. So we'll wait here a couple more seconds in case somebody is typing and they take they are like myself and they don't type that quickly. Okay, otherwise I think we are going to uh, stop the presentation. Again, you see my email address up there in McIntyreAcademy1.com. And if you would like to ask me a question that way, certainly feel free. Thank you very much for your time today.